Hi, Filmatics. Welcome back to part two with Michael Gibbons, director, cinematographer, and writer known for directing feature films, The Ghost Beyond, Angel Camouflage, Magic Christmas, Opposite Day, and Coyote Ugly Second Unit. So let's welcome back to the show, Michael Gibbons. Michael, welcome. Thank you very kindly. <laughs> You're welcome. So in part one, we were talking about Michael working with some spectacular directors like Ridley Scott, and um, we were talking about Ron Maxwell, Philip Borzo, Stephen Frears, and Peter Smiley. So we just want to continue on that path that Michael was discovered and got his big break, not discovered, but he got his big um, break when he did a Kellogg's Muselex commercial. Right, Michael? That's true. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I'd done some things before that, but, you know, it's like we, we like to say in Hollywood uh, about that overnight success that it usually takes about 10 years to get that overnight um, recognition. But uh, that was some huge recognition. But I, I want to say something about that, about why it, it, that, that period of the, the 80s, the 90s, was such an important uh, period of advertising. And uh, people, of course, look back in those days and say that it's just crass commercialism and all that sort of nonsense. But that crass commercialism is what paid you know, for good budgets and uh, you know, fertilized a, a lot of of creativity and talent, not just here, but all over the world. But the big wave, the big change that happened in American advertising actually came from Ridley Scott and about the time that Ridley Scott and Adrian Lyon decided to come to America. And Ridley was doing this sort of thing in Europe long before. And uh, America was still, you know, shooting people, shoving cereal in their mouth instead of shooting people walking up a road, you know, with the bicycle, you know, with, with bread in the front and wet streets and all this stuff. And it, it, that was a game changer when those guys came because their look was so phenomenal. And, and honestly, it's all, it, it, I, I, could, I could be wrong, but I, I think it's always based on uh, the paintings, you know, like uh, Baroque paintings of like Rembrandt and Vermeer and, and to uh, Rubens and this sort of stuff, because all of that in itself, besides being, you know, things of beauty, they also are storytelling. You might be crass and say that it's propaganda, but still storytelling at, um, at different levels and different mediums. But um, it was people like Ridley and Adrian that then combined that and brought it to the screen. Yeah. It's a, so Michael, so can you tell us, um, where you started, you, you actually studied photography first, right? Is that how you started um, on your journey to become a director? Uh, you know what, I, st I, st I started painting when I was a kid. Okay. My, uh, I used to paint and my parents actually got me a private tutor and uh, as a little boy, actually, I did paintings. And then I went to art school uh, specifically to because I wanted to get into film, but I didn't know how to do that. And so I went to East Tennessee State which in 1976, I think, had the best art department in the South, and I wanted to stay in the South. Uh, I actually got um, um, accepted at Pratt and uh, Cleveland Institute of Art and Chicago and a few other places, but I really wanted to stay there. And ETSU in Johnson City, Tennessee, had a phenomenal department. I think they still do, but... I'm not as close to it, obviously, but they, um, so I went there and I was studying drawing and painting and um, this sort, but also did photography. Before that, I had, because of, I was the school photographer when I was in high school and, and I got asked to teach um, workshops at Walford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina when I was uh, 17 and 18 years old. And so when I went to ETSU, they actually said, well, you can't start photography classes until you're a junior in college. And I said, yeah, but I've been actually teaching it in college. Can you look at this? And so they looked at my work and said, okay, we'll make an exception. <laughs> so I started from day one and I was doing photography and I, sh I, I actually took all of their photography classes 
uh, to the point where uh, in by the second half of my second year in college there, they were making up classes for me. And that was cool. And then I had an English professor that was a lovely fellow who I used to like to go and talk to after class because I liked uh, his use of words. And he told me, hey, you need to get out of here. You need to go to L.A. or you need to go to New York, uh, but you need to go. And I said, you know, that's, that was my plan. That's what I want to do after I graduate. But I th and he says, no, you've got everything that you can get from here. Get out of here. Wow. So I went, to Brooks, I went to Brooks Institute in Santa Barbara and I uh, studied uh, photography and film. And um, there's a funny story that I have about that. When I was at school, now this might not make the people at Brooks too happy, but actually they don't exist anymore. God bless them. But uh, the last year that I was there, um, I used to spend two or three days a week going to L.A. and sneaking onto the major lots to watch the big guys work. <laughs> I love it. But you can't do it. You can't do It's really hard to do now. But yeah. I would say it would be nearly impossible. But uh, I'm sure there's a, if there's a will, there's a way. But I, I, I'll tell you, I, 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 I drove a little Volkswagen and I drive that thing from Santa Barbara to L.A. And the first time I did it. I went to Paramount and I drove up to the gate and uh, the fella in the booth says, and what can I do for you? And I said, well, I just want to go in and look around. <laughs> <laughs> I was 20 years old. And, uh, and he says, well, I'll tell you what you can do. You just drive right over there and turn around and get the hell out of here. <laughs> so Sounds I, right. I did. Sounds right. <laughs> I did, but then I drove down to uh, Burbank and I saw Warner Brothers and I avoided the main gate and I went to another gate and sat in my car and watched people and I saw people walking in. And so I went and parked my car and then I mixed in with some people and just walked through the gate. <laughs> and then I found different ways to get in different places. Like I used to drive onto the lot at Warner and tell them that I was going to see Bob in the wardrobe department, assuming <laughs> there has to be a Bob there. And they would say, well, okay, great. Do you know where the wardrobe department is? Yes, of course I do. Of course I did not know, but I just needed to get on the lot. And then I would walk around and find, you know, if the, on the stage, which stages were shooting and if the light wasn't on, I knew I could walk in and I would go stand in the dark in a corner somewhere and just watch. Eventually I met people like, for instance, Fred Conecamp Jr., who was a wonderful DP and son of a wonderful DP. And I got to know him and he started telling me where he would shoot so I would know which stage to get on. He wouldn't give me a pass. I would still have to figure it out. But at uh, Universal, I used to go. I finally found where the day players park. I used to park in their lot and I would go stand at a gate and a school bus would come pick you up and the driver would say, <laughs> what stage? And I'd say six. And then he'd go, oh, I think six is dark today. And I go, oh, maybe it's nine. I'll find out. <laughs> and I didn't know. I would just get there, whatever we're shooting, you know, I would walk on set. Or sometimes I just walk around the back lot and look at that and just dream about it and that sort of thing. Uh, 20th Century Fox was an interesting one because there, there was a, a guard um, a shack and it was in the middle of the road. And I would park somewhere in the street, you know, in Century City, and then I would go, I would walk over and I would go through, there was another, right across from the guard shack was a little building where the day players would actually punch a time clock. And so I would go in, there was a window there where the guard could see you as you were punching your time clock. I would go and take somebody's card. I wouldn't, I would stand in front of the machine so he couldn't tell that I wasn't actually, you know, messing up somebody's accounting. But I would make like I put it there and then put it on the other side and I'd go inside. And like I went on, you know, the set of MASH and uh, I remember leaving a note on, um, gosh, what was it, Mike, what was his name that played? Anyway, was, anyway, I'd leave people notes, but I would go inside and just watch them shoot. And so I'd do that two or three times a week and um, I, I missed a lot of class because of that. But um, anyway, 
uh, so I got out of that school and uh, moved to LA and um, uh, immediately started sending out like 40 and 50 resumes a week for all sorts of projects. And, uh, well, that sounds like a movie or it's like you are the studio uh, crasher as opposed to the party crasher. I love it because well, wasn't there a story that you, Steven you know, the, the, Spielberg? You know, the king of that, the king of that was Steven Spielberg. OK, right. Steven Spielberg, he 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 was much more crass than me because he found an empty office. <laughs> and he just literally moved in <laughs> and nobody questioned him. What kahunas? Kahuna had a, a telephone put in there, and then he would call people and say, you know, set up a meeting and say, yeah, I'm on the lot at Universal. Yeah, just come over. I'll, I'll get you a pass. And he, he wasn't renting it. He was stealing it. God bless him. <laughs> that's you know? that's I, really I, I real. It to him, I, you know? I thought it was fake, but it's really, really real. Wow. No, it's real. And, and, you know, there's so much stuff going on on a major lot. They don't know. And, you know, if you behave yourself and you sneak on there and you watch people, they don't even know you're there. You know, they just think that you're a PA or something. Oh, which wow. Was a funny thing. People, yeah, but, it was it was amazing. It yeah. Was stuff. So, so, so you, anyway, let's 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 come further into the future. So so you're learning on the lot. But you, you went to like your self-taught film school at the studio, like self-taught. And yeah. So, yeah. So, well, the thing is, I networked, you know, okay. I would eventually speak to people. I'd speak to the camera assistants, to the gaffers, you know, and, you know, ask them you know, quietly questions about what they were doing and things like that. And uh, by the time I graduated, I actually knew people, you know, like, um, oh gosh, what was his name? Richard, gosh, I forget his name. He was the president of Panavision, but he was also a DP. Um, but I met him and, and Fred Conacamp, which was the, he, he was he was a lot of use to me. Um, but, you know, I just met people and then learned how to behave. And, uh, you know, it didn't, uh, like at least I knew, you know, something about the business, actual business. Um, there was also a thing that like, there was a number of guys that went to the school that I went to and it was a very well respected school, but it was a cinematography school. It wasn't a director's school. And some of these guys thought, you know, I'm going to get out of school and, you know, Hollywood's going to welcome me and they're going to give me big movies. And it's just not that easy. And uh, so they, you know, we had to make a film to graduate. Now, I couldn't afford to make a film. You know, my parents scraped together every penny they could to send me to that school. I, I, you know, I had to work full time while I was there and uh, I couldn't afford it. So I shot for other people and I was afraid I wasn't even going to graduate. And I, I had to go get my professor, Rex Fleming, to sign um, my, you know, this thing, this card that said that I'd been to class when I had <laughs> virtually not been to class. And he uh, waited the last day to do that. And he wasn't there. And his assistant called him and he got on the phone with me and said, I just want to tell you, I love your work. And I've been grading you on what you've been doing for other people. And um, uh, so for that, I graduated at the top of my class. And I went straight to work. And now, go, I went to work going to work, you know, uh, because the work of getting work is is the is the hard work. And um, like I said, I would send out, you know, 40 to 50 resumes a week. Sometime back then, they were all hand typed. Of course, my resume I would print up, but I would every now and then I'd get bored and I would like cut out a paper bag from the grocery store, which basically was, you know, a garbage bag. And I would type my cover letter on that garbage bag and send it just to get attention. <laughs> it's like willing to work, you, you know, out of paper, need job now. Uh, but that's a testament that not everyone is um, born into the business or has a family member to teach them. But so many are talented and just need a foot in. It's hard for men or women. It's hard for anyone who's not born into the business or famous. If you are not a working working person, it's hard for males or females or anyone. So, it, it, you know, it's about that, though. even even if you are born in the business, you need to have a finished product. Uh, as in, when I, when I say finished, I mean, you need to be able to show that you've got some talent. I mean, like, like for instance, um, uh, Jordan Cronowith, his son is, a, is an excellent DP, brilliant. Okay, okay, he learned from the best. 
uh, Jordan was at a commercial production company with me. And so I had the opportunity to meet him and talk to him back in the day. And he uh, was a lovely, incredible, talented man. But if his son, you know, might have gotten the breaks, but if he didn't have the talent, if he didn't have the chops, he wouldn't last, you know? And so there's that. So usually, you know, the people that are born into the business, if they don't bring something, you know, they, they, they have a hard time too. It's a very, very tough business, but the toughest part of the business, the toughest part as far as movie making is always the raising the money for a movie. That's the hardest bit. Yeah. So, so, so you, so you, you went on these lots, Fox and Warner Brothers and Paramount, and then like, what was your first gig, or what if, what was your rememberable gig that you got that you're like, wow, I'm in, I'm working. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? It, it, again, networking is very, very important. I met a man through a composer friend of mine, a composer named John Morgan, who is uh, one of the most talented, incredible, beautiful composers ever. He's still around, still working. And he was literally like raised in the business by Max Steiner. And uh, he knew, uh, um, um, gosh, uh, Bernard Herrmann. And uh, the, the guy was brilliant. He's still brilliant. Okay. Anyway, he introduced me to a dear friend of his, a fellow named Bill Stromberg. Now, Bill worked mostly in the effects end of the world, but he'd made a few movies as a director. Yeah. Wow. And he wanted to That's make incredible. a few more. Well, well, Bill is the father of Robert Stromberg, who directed Maleficent, and uh, he won the Academy Award for designing Avatar, and then won the Academy Award the year after that for designing uh, Alice in Wonderland by Tim Burton. And so I, I knew that guy, Robert, since he was like 16 years old. And then his brother, also, also named Bill Stromberg, Billy Stromberg, is also a composer. But anyway, he introduced me to, to Big Bill, the, uh, the dad. And Bill wanted to get some movies off the ground. And so he wanted to shoot some scenes to show what these films would look like. And, you know, we went out with... Um, uh, gosh, we, we were shooting on like an Airy C. I think we, we had a Mitchell and, you know, it was all, you know, wooden legs and whorl heads and this sort of stuff, but, you know, with um, pocket change. And so we shot a number of these promos for movies. In fact, I still do that today. I actually, next weekend, I'm going to shoot a teaser for a horror film that I'm about to do. And, um, but I did those things with him. And to me, that was sort of like, okay, I'm finally working. I'm working with somebody that's cool and talented and, and that sort. And it was, you know, I, I was actually, uh, uh, I knew at that point just enough to be dangerous. I wish that I could go back in time and go shoot that again for that man because he deserves better. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow! So so then you 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 worked with all these great directors, and then then how did you transform to your what is your first directing uh, feature that you you um, went to the next level? Well, uh, first of all, let me let me just say you know how it was that I became a director because I I didn't get into this business to be a director. I uh, I got into business to to make film and to tell stories through film as a little boy. I didn't know that really what I needed to be doing was thinking about being a director. Uh, I was visually oriented. I was a painter and a photographer and, uh, and I still do those things. I just don't paint. I really need to, but I don't, uh, I study painting. I use painting for so many things that I do when I'm researching what I'm, what I'm about to shoot. I, I take influence from the people that understood light to the point that they had to paint it on a piece of canvas. Uh, but, um, Anyway, I was actually uh, in France, and I was looking to buy uh, an apartment in Paris, and I was literally at the bank ready to sign papers to buy this place, and um, I got a call from Ridley Scott, who said, what are you doing? 
And I said, uh, I'm just, you know, hanging out, having some fun. And and he said, yeah, uh, you need to get back to L.A. And I was living in L.A. at the time, but I was about to move to Paris. And, and, Live the uh, dream. Oh, my gosh. He says, uh, you know, get back. And he was in London at the time, and he left London a day early to go have this sit down with me. And he set me down and he said, um, whether you do this at my company or not, you need to be a director. And I said, well, you know, because I'd had advertising agencies come into me and saying, you know, we want you to do like they offered me a Marlboro commercial and, and uh, the, you know, other things that other people were trying to get me to direct. There was a wonderful production company in L.A. called Michael Daniels and the guy that owned it, Michael uh, uh, Remersa, uh, tried to um, – uh, anyway, he he was trying to get me to join his company, and I just wasn't really sure that's what I wanted to do. But when Ridley Scott said it, <laughs> I listened, and I uh, had to ask him why. And this is the thing that really knocked me on my heels. Now you got to understand, you know, the hey, this is 1989, and the 80s and the 90s were it, it, there was so much money that was spent. I made a lot of money. Um, uh, I mean, it was ridiculous. And re because I, I was, I worked so much. The last two years that I was just a cinematographer, I was working, the, the last two years I worked 650 days. Yeah. And that meant that I was flying like from Rome to South Africa to Hamburg and go, doing multiple jobs one right after another. And um, later on, I ended up uh, starting a production company in Amsterdam, and we sort of based out of there because it was central to that side of the world. And that was unbelievably successful. But the point is, is that when Ridley said that, and I said, why? Why do you think I should be a director? And his answer was so surprising because to me, Ridley Scott was the Rembrandt of the 20th century. I think if if Rembrandt had been born in the 1930s when Ridley was born, I think he would have been Ridley Scott. Uh, and so when he said the reason that you should be directing is because anybody that can generate as much money as you do should be directing. And I thought, what? I, this is not what I expected to hear. I expected him to say, you've got a good eye. You have a good eye. You know how to tell a story with a picture. But actually, he, he is a businessman that understands business. And this is the thing. Ridley Scott still works all the time. He doesn't just do his own projects. He produces other people's projects. He's always got TV series that he's got his hand into. And he everything he touches is friggin' amazing. And he understands that. And he saw something in me. I still haven't found if I've actually discovered just what he saw, but um, uh, I, that's what turned me. I said, wow, okay. That's <laughs> money. Odd. Money is so, good. <laughs> so, I, well, money is good because that's, that, that's the way things happen. You know, and, you know, we can all go and get ourselves, you know, a little $2,000 Sony camera and go shoot a movie with it. Um, but if you don't have all of that, money behind you you don't have all that production value and and you can argue with me all day long well it all d depends on story okay it depends greatly on story it also depends on casting casting is besides the money to in order to make the part the project nothing is more important than casting if if the people that are actually breathing life into your characters are not the right people you're sunk you're sunk. No matter how beautiful you make your movie, no matter how great your effects are, how wonderful your underscore is, if, you're, if your actors are not connecting at the level that they need to for, for this project, you're, you're, you're sunk. And Ridley is brilliant at not letting that happen. 
and and then so I just want to let um, people know they're listening that you um, you have a successful relationship with the production company GLG, and then you formed your own company, My, Michael Givens and Associates, and you joined forces with the five-time Academy Award nominated director cinematographer Caleb De Chanel at Darklight yeah. Pictures because um, I just want them to know how fabulous you are. Um, and equally important, but I believe he also, when he said that, sure, it's about money, but you are extremely talented cinematographer, lighting, story, production, um, and director. So you have all that background to be, you know, to ex, ex, to be equal or even exceed because you have all that knowledge and training and studying and becoming a master and becoming a master um, director is what I would hope that people would want over like um, to really look at people's qualifications, not just say, oh, we need someone in this X category because X category is the category we need right now. But I would hope qualifications is still something that people are looking for because a beautiful film and an outstanding film done by a master director and a master storyteller and a master filmmaker that has all those credentials and, and backing should be looked upon first because the qualifications are there and will make an extraordinary film. That's just my thing. I'm a female. I would love to direct. I'm always asking um, people can, Hey, can you, you know, let me shadow and stuff because that's my, my, my thing, but I'm so excited about you. And, um, and so, so you, you, he, he, he talks to you and tells you to become a director. So did you, how did you decide on your first film then? Well, actually, I joined his company as a commercial director, and I was there for some time. I did some commercials like, um, gosh, Northwest Airlines and a few things. And then uh, I made the decision to leave, not because we had any sort of fallen out um, and not really because I got a better deal, but... Uh, it was really kind of a political thing of who was at the company and how they were structuring it and that sort of thing. And so I left and joined with Don Block at GLG, which was at that time was called Gibson Lefebvre Gartner. I'd shot with a few people that worked there. I shot for uh, Brian Gibson. I did part of a movie with him. I shot with Katrine Lefebvre a number of times. And uh, Jim Gartner, I did a number of commercials with him. He's absolutely brilliant. He, he made a movie as well. He made a basketball movie some years ago. I wasn't associated with it, but he, he's, a, he's a dream to work with, one of the nicest guys in the world. Um, we're, we're not all nice in this business, but um, sometimes, you know, you do meet them. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an ego-driven business, and people get upset and nervous about their careers. But um, then I left there and sort of wanted to go back to RSA, and uh, that didn't work out. And so I was approached by a producer that I had done a number of really wonderful global jobs with. I did a series of Credit Swiss commercials that we shot all over the world. And um, uh, this guy called me up and said, you know, why don't we do your own company? And so we created... Michael Gibbons and Associates, which was in uh, New York and Amsterdam. So Amsterdam and New Amsterdam. And that was very successful. And then I um, left that to go to Caleb's company, and uh, that didn't work for other reasons. It all doesn't work, you know. Some of it does, some of it doesn't, but that didn't work out. And um, then... Um, um, I started doing movies all the time, and I did I did this movie called Opposite Day, which is a comedy for kids, and uh, that was an interesting project because um, that when when it was presented to me, there were two scripts, and I was living in Beaufort, South Carolina at the time, and um, I flew to L.A. to pitch uh, what I thought would be the best way to shoot that movie. And I really liked one of the scripts, and I didn't really care for the other one. The one that I liked was based on magic, and the other one was based on science. The problem with science is, as we know from our you know, past year of suffering, is that science has to be proven 
And that's true in film. If you're going to shoot something about science, you have to make it make some sort of sense. And if it's magic, it, you know, magic is magic. And so um, I pitched the magic film and then they said, what if we go with the other script? And I said, well, you know, it would be all right. And this is what I do. But then they booked me to do the magic one. And then two weeks before we went to camera, they said, by the way, we're switching scripts. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Well, on that note, let's end part two with Michael Gibbons. And please listen to part three with Michael Gibbons, his fascinating story on how he became a director from cinematographer to director. Thanks for listening, everyone. Part three. Catch you then.